Scripture reading comes from the book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses 1 through 7. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who is seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, It is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. He who overcomes will inherit all this, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. This is the word of the Lord. You know... Every time I've preached here today, and there's been at least seven or eight now, I've always thought, it's what? This is one of the most wonderful, fragrant smelling audiences I've ever encountered. And and people have pointed out it was just, it's really these. But it's really fragrant up here. So I'm going to try to forget that and give you something interesting. When Jesus Christ is raised from the dead, he's called the first fruits. There's a number of places where he's called the first fruits from the dead. First fruits means a first installment. It's the first fruits were the, was the beginning of the harvest, the very first gathered sheaves or fruit from the harvest. So first fruits means first installment. A first installment, okay. So when Jesus was raised from the dead, that was the first installment on something. What? This, the thing you just read or heard read. See that? The new heavens and the new earth. This is, uh, as great as the resurrection of Jesus Christ is, and it means everything, yet it's only the first installment on something to come, and this is it. New heavens, new earth, city of God. Now, I want you to see that John was not writing this the way we think he was writing it. You know, people say, oh, the book of Revelation, lots of weird symbols Very interesting. Well, it is, but he didn't write it for us to be 2,000 years later sitting around in a kind of abstract academic way trying to work out the symbols. He wrote it for a group of people, a group of churches that were facing some terrible things. And he wrote this in order to give them a living hope. And if you understand it like that, if you understand it that Jesus Christ when he was raised from the dead, was an installment, a first installment, on something to come, that when you understand it and you grasp it, uh, it enables you to face things that otherwise you wouldn't be able to face. Because you have a living hope, not just an abstract idea, but a living hope. So if you want to understand what this text is about, and even what the resurrection of Jesus Christ is about, come with me and we'll look at the, the, the nature of this hope, the need you have for it, and how to receive it, how to have it, how to get it. The nature of it, the need for it, and how to get it. Okay, first of all, and this is real short, let me tell you what the nature of this is. It's the word coming down. See that? And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven. Do you know why this is? Actually, this changed my life. Those two words changed my life years ago. Changed the way in which I understand it, stood at Christianity in many ways. You know why? Here's John the Apostle, and he's getting a vision of the future, of, of the, the end of time, the end of history. And what does he see at the end of history? What's the climax at the end of history? It's not individual souls rising up and escaping this material world, the earth. He doesn't have, you don't see individual souls escaping the earth and going to heaven. What do you have is heaven coming down and transforming the earth. 
That's the reason why I can say, we can say, that Jesus is the first fruits, is the resurrected Christ is the, is the first installment on this. Because what this is, is this is on earth. This is the new heavens and new earth. In which we have new bodies. See, God didn't just create spirit, he also created body. And he's not just redeeming your spirit, but he's redeeming your body. And what is out there is an absolutely rewoven, perfect, healed, material world. A world in which people hug each other. See, they don't just, they don't just have little mental telepathy. They're not just, as somebody once said, in the kingdom of God, as the Bible depicts it, you don't hover, you know, six inches above the pavement. See, you walk in the kingdom of God, you march in the kingdom of God, you dance, you hug, you kiss, and you eat in the kingdom of God. Because Jesus ate a fish. The risen Christ said, I'm not a ghost. Look, give me a fish. And he ate it. One of my favorite verses in the Bible. Okay? They gave him a fish and he ate the fish. And they said, oh my gosh, you're not a ghost. No. Because the nature of this hope is not just pie in the sky by and by, but a feast on earth. <laughs> See? Not just, oh, we're going to be, in, you know, esoteric souls that kind of, you know, uh, you know, have some sort of uh, telepathy amongst each other where we're, we're sort of hovering around there and there's clouds and harps. No, this world, the world that we actually never had, you know, whenever, one of the, the, the things that's so sad, of course, is that, you, you, you know, when you're a little, you remember certain times and places and uh, as being just the greatest, just the greatest beach cottage, the greatest, you know, you know, mountain setting, the greatest this, the greatest that. When you actually go back, you always realize, hmm, this is what it was. But I remember it as being a whole lot better than it really was. And of course, this is what the uh, this is what uh, the Goethe and the other Romantic poets, I mean, the European Romantic poets, poets called Zainzucht. And it's kind of a, it's a German word and it has a, it's really kind of untranslatable. And it means blissful longing, soul longing. You know, you're longing for a family you never had. <laughs> really? You're longing for a body you never had. You're longing for a home you never had. You're longing for a beach you never had, a mountain you never had. You're longing for um, a world you never had. And John says, but it's coming. It's coming. And look, in verse 3, it says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. Okay? In other words, the relationship with God is healed. And then it says in verse 4, He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Now, if you if and if you were if you're any of those long suffering people who've actually been coming here through this incredibly long series in which we started, with, remember with Genesis, went through Romans, the Revelation. Back in Genesis, in Genesis three, we re, you remember that when we lost our relationship with God, we lost all other relationships. When our relationship with God fell apart, our psycholo- our relationship with our true selves fell apart. You know, and Adam and Eve immediately began to experience fear and. Anxiety and, and their relationships with each other fell apart. They had to hide. And their relationships with nature fell apart, with the physical world, and they began to experience aging and disease and death. When your relationship with God falls apart, all other relationships fall apart, and that's the reason why we have a longing for, some, for something in this world that this world never, ever was able to fulfill because it's always been broken. But when the relationship with God is put right, every other relationship will be put right. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. All that'll be wiped away. Everything sad will be wiped away. And that's coming. That's on its way. Not individual souls escaping the world and going off into heaven, but heaven coming down and transforming the world. That's the nature of it. The second, that's the nature of the hope. Now, secondly, let me talk to you about the need for this hope. Let me talk to you about how practical it is you don't just say, well, that's interesting, so that's the Christian teaching on that. No, this isn't just the Christian teaching. This is, this is a life-transforming living hope, if you understand it. Who was John writing to? 
He was writing, if you go back to Revelation 2 and 3, he was writing to people who were suffering terrible things. But you don't have to go back to Revelation 2 and 3. You can actually see what the people were suffering that he was writing to in verse 4. He was writing to people who were about to experience more death and mourning and crying and pain than anybody in this room probably ever has seen or ever will see. Because at the end of the first century, the emperor Domitian, the Roman emperor Domitian, was the first emperor to do wi- begin widespread, large-scale persecution of Christians. And Christians had their homes taken away and plundered. And Christians were sent into the arena to be torn to pieces by wild beasts as the crowds watched. And Christians were impaled on stakes and while still alive, covered with pitch and lit. And Christians were crucified sometimes by the hundreds or even thousands along the highways in and out of Rome so that people could see the Christians as they came and went from the city dying by inches. That's what they faced. And what did John give them so they could face it? John gave them this. John gave them the new heavens and new earth. That's what he gave them to face that. And it's a simple fact of history that it worked. It did. We know that the early Christians took their suffering with such poise and with such peace. And they sang hymns as the beasts were tearing them apart. And and they forgave the people that were killing them. They took their suffering and they took their death and their mourning and their crying and their tears with such poise and peace that the more people killed them, the more the, the, the Christian movement grew. And Tertullian, one of the early church fathers, actually said, the, bro- the blood of the martyrs is like seed. Because the more we killed them, he said, no, the, the, more, the more they killed us, the more we, our movement grew. Why? Because when people watch Christians dying like that, they said... These people have got something. Well, you know what they had? They had this. It's a living hope. Human beings are absolutely hope-shaped creatures. You live now. The way you live now is completely controlled by what you believe about your future. Did you hear me? The way you live now is completely controlled by what you believe about your future. Let me give you two illustrations. One was an old tale I was reading some years ago about two men, and they were captured and thrown into a deep, dark dungeon where they were going to suffer hard labor for 10 years. That was their penalty. But just before they went into that deep, dark dungeon, one of the men discovered that his wife and child were dead. And the other man heard and found out that just before he went into the dungeon that his wife and child were alive and waiting for him. And you know what happened? After just a couple of years, the first man just wasted away, curled up and died. And the other man endured and resisted and stayed strong and walked out a free man 10 years later. And you say, that's not surprising. No, it's not. But think about it. Same circumstances, same people, same situation. And yet they experienced their now in two completely different ways because of what they believed about their future, their then. The now is controlled by the then. Your present is controlled by what you believe about your future. Or my, my more favorite, my f- more favorite, more favorite, my favoriter? No, that's no good either. <laughs> the, uh, another illustration I like maybe even better is you put two guys into a, into a room, you know, at a table you know, a dingy room, and you say, for 10 hours a day, I want you to take a widget, and I want you to screw it on the wadget. So you screw it, you know what a, you don't know what, I'm not going to go into it now, we don't have time. Okay. You don't understand, well, anyway, so they have to just screw a widget on a wadget. Very tedious, very boring. Same room, same situation, 10 hours a day. But you tell the one guy, and at the end of one year, you'll be paid an an annual salary of $20,000. And you tell the other person, and at the end of this year, you'll be paid an annual salary of $20 million. And you know what's going to happen. After about one month or two months, the first guy's going to say, I can't take it, I can't take it, it's so tedious, it's so awful, I don't need this, and he quits. And the other guy is whistling why he works and saying, I don't, I don't find it tedious at all. And you know, they're, they're, they're experiencing the same circumstances in two utterly different ways because of what they believe about their future. Now, it makes all the difference. 
All the difference. Do you believe that when you die, you rot? That this world is all you got? And someday the sun is going to die and all human civilization is going to be gone and nobody will remember anything anyone's ever done? Or do you believe new heavens and new earth, judgment day? Nobody's going to get away with anything. And therefore, everything you do right now counts forever. Those are two utterly different futures. And depending on which one you believe, you're going to live in two utterly different ways. And let me, let me show you. Uh, remember, you know, some of you would have been here. But I'm going to, I'm going to it's just too good an illustration. As I said, this hope, the thing that John gave the early Christians, enabled them to face stuff that you, way worse than anything you and I will ever be facing. And they, and they triumphed over it. Well, you know, a month ago or so, we had our open forum here on African-American spirituals. And uh, in getting ready for that open forum in my lecture, I came upon an African-American scholar named Howard Thurman. And in 1947, he uh, gave a lecture at Harvard University on the meaning of the Negro spiritual. And he, re- and he responded to one of the great... Uh, especially back then, but even today, one of the great uh, criticisms of the African-American spiritual is it's so otherworldly that the spirituals are filled with, with references to heaven and to, you know, uh, to judgment day and to the crowns and the thrones and, and, and the robe I'm going to have out there. In other words, it's, they're just filled with references to the new heavens and new earth. And Howard Thurman heard what people said and said, you know, the slaves, all that Christianity stuff and all that, that uh, heaven and, and resurrection and, and judgment day and all that stuff, that just made them docile and submissive. They would have been better off without it. And Howard Thurman in his, uh, his lecture said this. He says, well, but the facts have made it clear that this faith, this sung faith, serve to deepen the capacity of the slaves for endurance and their ability to absorb their suffering. And it taught a people how to ride high in life, how to look squarely in the face those facts that argue most dramatically against all hope, and to use those facts as raw material out of which they fashioned a hope that their environment, with all its cruelty, could not crush. This enabled them to reject annihilation and to affirm a terrible right to live. You hear what he's saying? He says the slaves, because they knew about the new heavens and new earth, because they knew about Judgment Day, because they knew eventually all of their desires would be fulfilled and nobody was going to get away with anything and all wrongdoing would be put down, because they believed in that, they, could, they lived in an environment that was horribly cruel. And in that environment, all the facts said, hopeless, despair. And they said, no, that's mine, that's my, I belong to that. And as a result, Howard Thurman says, it enabled them to fashion a hope that their environment with all its cruelty could not crush. It was a hope that couldn't crush. Why? Because it couldn't reach it. It, Hope was out there. It's in the future. And they had this living hope. And what it said, it enabled them to reject annihilation and affirm a terrible right to live. And, you know, later on in the the, uh, chapter, in in the lecture, uh, Howard Thurman is told by people, well, but you can't take these things literally, resurrection, you know, crowns and thrones. You can't take it literally. But he says, well, if you can't take it literally, then it's not a hope. You know? He said, imagine this. Imagine that you could, imagine you could, you know, go back in time and sit down with the a, with a slaves and say, well, you know, you, you, really, you folks need an education. And if you went to one of the better schools here, uh, you would know that this life is all there is. And there really isn't a judgment day and there's not new heavens and new earth <clears throat> and heaven and all that stuff. You know, this life is all there is. Now get out there and live a life of hope in your misery and your slavery. You know, and can you imagine somebody saying, okay, well, okay, I, let me get this straight, I and all my children and grandchildren are consigned to lives of endless brutality and grinding poverty, and there is no judgment day in which wrongdoing will ever be put right, and there is no future world in life in which any of my desires will be satisfied. This life is all there is. And now... That I know that I'm supposed to go out, keep my head high, and have a hope that nothing crushes? What would that hope be in? Look, none of us are probably ever going to be thrown to lions and torn limb to limb as people cheer. And probably none of us are going to ever experience a life of servitude and slavery. Thank God. We have things, though, are bothering us so much 
and are weighing us down, and they're nothing like those things. But all I want you to know is that it's a simple fact of history that people taking this living hope and taking it to the center of their lives triumphed over things like that. What about you and me? What's our, what's our, what's our problem? Because when, when the truth of this hope pierces you like a shaft, clear and cold, when you realize it's true, that all the worst evil you can face here is in the end a passing thing. Because there's light and high beauty forever beyond its reach. And this high light and high beauty is your destiny. It's going to change you. Don't you see you need it? Don't you see you need a living hope? Don't you see that you're affected by what you believe about the future? So that's the nature of the hope, and that's the need for the hope. And that leaves us to one last thing. How do we get it? How do we take it? How do we get a hold of it? And the answer is you have to believe in both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And actually, both the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ are alluded to in this in the end of this passage. And it's easy to see the illusion if you have read all of John's writings. Because see, John the, the apostle who wrote the book of Revelation also wrote the gospel of John and the letters of John. And here's what I want you to see. First of all, if you want this hope, you have to understand and grasp and believe in the cross. It says here in verse 6, To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost from the spring of the water of life. To him who is thirsty, I will give to drink without cost, free, the water of life. Now remember back in John, well, I'll tell you, back in John chapter 4, Jesus meets this woman at the well, and she's had a mess of a life. And he says, but guess what, I can give you a water that if you drink it, you'll never be thirsty again. And at first she thinks that he's talking about physical water, and he's talking about eternal life. And he says, I can give you an exper- a foretaste of this river of life in the city of God. We're all, you know, what, what does it mean? What does it mean to drink the water of life and never thirst again? What it means is the deepest longings of your soul, the longing for love, the longing for value, the longing to last, all the deepest longings of your soul and your heart will be satisfied in that river. And even now, you can get a foretaste of it, the grace of God, the salvation of God, the spirit of God, the eternal life of God. And Jesus says, you can have it free, without cost. Well, how could that be? Because near the end of the Gospel of John, we have Jesus Christ on the cross, and he says a number of significant things, but the one thing he says is, I thirst. That wasn't just physical thirst, because then he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And on the cross, Jesus Christ was experiencing the cosmic thirst that we deserve so that we can have the water of life without price. Or put it this way, On the cross, Jesus Christ was experiencing cosmic hopelessness. See, our hope is that all the deepest desires of our hearts will be, all the deepest desires of our hearts will find fulfillment in the river of life that flows down the central street of the city of God in the new heavens and new earth. That's our hope. But on the cross, Jesus Christ lost everything he had, he lost the face of God. And therefore, Jesus Christ, because he took our punishment upon himself, would have experienced somehow the cosmic hopelessness that belongs to us, that we deserve. Have you ever understood or thought about the substitutionary hopelessness of Jesus Christ? That he experienced the hopelessness you and I should experience as our substitute. He got the hopelessness we deserve so we could have a hope that we don't and know that that hope will never disappoint us. He got the cosmic thirst that we deserve so we could have the river of life. And when you understand that he did that for you, then you have, uh, that's the first and most, first, maybe, first and most foundational step. You believe he did that for you, then you can have this hope. But the second thing, the second step is the resurrection. He didn't just die, he was raised again. And then he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. See, Jesus is the beginning. Newness of life, Jesus Christ. New body. But he's the first fruits, the first installment, and eventually everything will be made new. And you need to realize that the resurrection of Jesus Christ means no matter what happens to you now, it can only make you better. You know what suffering that comes into your life, if you face it with hope, 
There's only two things that can happen. It'll either make you a better person or it'll kill you, and then it'll really make you a better person. <laughs> Donald Gray Barnhouse, who was a great pastor, preacher down at 10th Presbyterian Church in Philadelphia for many years. And by the way, he used to take a train from Philadelphia back in the 40s and 50s. He'd take a train from Philadelphia every Tuesday and have a preaching service at Calvary Baptist Church on 57th Street. Donald Gray Barnhouse. And one of the great tragedies of his life was he married a great woman and they were, when he was still young and they only had one little girl, Margaret, I think her name was. And before the, Margaret was even 10 years old, um, his wife died. Margaret's mother died. It was a great tragedy. And, um, you know, Dr. Barnhouse was trying to help his little girl and himself process, you know, the loss of the mother. And it was a horrible thing. And one day he had an idea because they were crossing a street and a truck came awfully close to Margaret. And Margaret screamed, but it wasn't too bad. I mean, but it, it scared her. And, you know, her father picked her up and carried her off and he said, there, it's okay, it's okay. It wasn't too bad. And she was kind of scared. And he had an idea. And he says, you know how sad we are about mommy? Yes, we're sad about mommy. Well, let me just ask you a question. Did the truck hit you? No. What hit you? Just the shadow of the truck. That's okay. Well, death didn't hit your mom. Only the shadow of death hit your mother. Death hit Jesus. And because death hit Jesus, and we believe in him, now the only thing that can hit us now is the shadow of death, and that is just, the shadow of death is but my entrance into glory. Don't you see? <laughs> if you believe in the resurrection, you don't just have this later You've got hope for now. You know, we sing that song, Christ the Lord is risen today. And the last line of the last stanza is, made like him, like him we rise, ours the cross, the grave, the skies. What does that mean? Come on, crosses. The lower you lay me, the higher you will raise me. Come on, grave. Just try. Kill me. And all you'll do is make me better than before. If the resurrection happened, if the death of Jesus Christ happened for us and he took our hopelessness, so now we have hope. And the resurrection of Jesus Christ happened. Even the worst things are only the best things. And the greatest is yet to come. Live a completely transformed life on the basis of that living hope. Let us pray. Our Father, we now ask that you would help us to understand how great our hope is and help us to begin to live in accordance with it. And we ask that you would now begin to make this hope not just an abstract belief in our head but a living reality in our heart so that we can have the contentment and we can have the poise and we can have the humility and we can have the joy of people who understand this so that we can live those great lives that lots of other people have lived before us no reason why we can't too so help us to be a people like that we pray in Jesus name Amen